Take us through how we calculate uh, our risks of exposure in these various environments. Um, so you've just got to look at these different environments. Um, the, the biggest risks of exposure come from being indoors um, with a room that has poor air exchange and with lots of people. So whenever you put yourself into that situation, um, the risk um, just starts to elevate and go up. And if you get into that situation where you have um, you know, people talking or yelling or singing, um, it just increases the risk because more of what comes out of your mouth, those respiratory droplets, more of those are expelled into the environment, um, which then just increases the opportunity for you to inhale them in. And you, you mentioned in the piece you wrote about this, for example, that singing is the most dangerous of all of those things, that more comes out in singing than in just speaking. Yeah, so just breathing, it's a, a fairly low level. Um, low talking, it increases by about tenfold. Um, when you start yelling and start singing, um, you're looking at tenfold further and you're aerosolizing those droplets even further. Um, and so it creates a greater risk. And you've also told us to factor in the amount of time we spend. So if we walked into a conference room with three people and we spent three minutes socially distanced from them, that's a much lower risk than sitting in that conference room with them for three hours breathing the same air. Yeah, that's exactly right. You need to get exposed to the, envir uh, the virus over a, a period of time um, to essentially get to a dose of virus in which you're going to be infected. And that's going to be different for each person, but it is time and exposure that becomes important. So minimizing the amount of time that you spend in those environments becomes really important in lowering your risk. And what about restaurants? Because there's talk of restaurants opening now. What's the risk there? Well, you know, in restaurants, and depends on the, the ambience of the restaurant, um, you know, you've got lots of people talking and conversing. So you have all the, the usual problems of transfer on objects and surfaces that people touch, those high contact surfaces. But you've also got the um, release of those droplets into the air um, to the people at your table. And depending on the airflow, the people at the table beside you. And the longer an infected person spends in that area, the more they can potentially release into the environment, which then increases the risk for everybody else who's in that restaurant. There's some reporting on uh, the Tyson plant on the deaths that occurred that one person who died actually took Tylenol before entering the plant so that her temperature would be lower uh, because she feared not getting the bonus that she would get uh, if she went to work. Uh, she, in fact, did have coronavirus and ultimately died from it. Uh, do you see people are taking desperate measures like that in a workplace uh, like this to try to uh, keep their incomes alive and hold on to their jobs? I do know a lot of the patients that we care for at People's Clinic, uh, again, it's an underserved population, and uh, they take care of, uh, it's a uh, multi-generational uh, families. And so sometimes that one person is really the breadwinner for a lot of people in the family. Um, so it's amazing what hunger and desperation um, um, can do to make you want to go to work and earn that income to keep not only yourself going, but your family as well. Donald Trump said today that anyone who wants to be tested can be tested. Now, that is patently untrue on its face. Uh, the admiral said everyone who needs to be tested according to his definition of need, can now be tested in the United States. Is that true? Well, it's actually not in the sense that we may have excess tests in some location, but that doesn't help you if the person who needs testing is hundreds of miles away. What we need is a system where every community in this country has access to the testing for those who are ill today. 
And therefore, we don't have a system that tests everybody when they need it. And that's one of the things we have to build. But again, they've been built state by state, governor by governor. And what we need is a national system to make that work. And we don't have that. Ben, uh, the pre President Obama is saying, look, this coronavirus would have been bad in the United States. It was going to hit hard. Uh, the numbers were going to be difficult to bear. Uh, and by the way, that means, you know, 20,000 dead, maybe, or some number smaller than the current number, but difficult. But with this Trump administration, Barack Obama sees it as chaos. Uh, I think we have a right to believe that those words got to Donald Trump. Yeah, they absolutely did, because uh, everything that Barack Obama does seems to trigger uh, Donald Trump all the way back to when Donald Trump built his political brand, saying that Barack Obama wasn't born in the United States. I think what bothers President Obama so much, uh, is, frankly, is he used to tell us um, that he saw the presidency as running a relay race. You run your leg, and then you hand off the baton to the guy after you, or the woman after you. And the relay race that he ran when it came to these types of diseases is, you know, we had an Ebola outbreak that really rattled us in 2014. It, it took the lives of two people here in the United States. After that, President Obama set up a pandemic preparedness office in the White House that President Trump shut down. He set up uh, a playbook, literally, that was handed to the Trump administration on how do you respond to a pandemic? They tossed it in the garbage. He set up a cabinet-level exercise in the transition, the incoming Trump team, and they clearly ignored that. And frankly, they ended up getting rid of most of the people who were in that exercise, given the turnover, and set up a global infrastructure of people to monitor for pandemics, including somebody who was in China and worked with that lab in Wuhan. And Trump downsized that program by 75 percent, including getting rid of that person who could have been our eyes and ears in China. And so what is, I think is so frustrating is that you run your leg of the relay race and you try to set it up for the next person and they come along and they ignore all that. And that has real life consequences, life and death consequences, depression level economic consequences. Uh, there's also uh, an implication here for the campaign, because in some of the leaked material, uh, President Obama was saying how vigorously he hopes to campaign for Joe Biden. I'm not sure how they do that if they can't be on a campaign trail, but uh, you know, online somehow. Um, and it seems that if if President Obama is such a trigger for Donald Trump, that every time uh, he does any kind of campaign appearance for Joe Biden, uh, there's going to be an explosive reaction from Donald Trump. Yeah, no, and I can tell you, Lawrence, I've talked to the former president. He's going to be campaigning however he can, whether that's in person or whether that's online whatever medium he can, he's going to take this message out to the American people in a way that I think the American people haven't heard from him in a while. And, and if you heard his endorsement video of Joe Biden, he made a very comprehensive and forceful case, not just against Donald Trump, but for Joe Biden. Um, and I think, you know, Donald Trump, you know, it's interesting, Lawrence, I think presidents get used to not having people kind of at their level uh, taking shots at them or pointing out what they've done wrong. We know that this president, Donald Trump, surrounds himself with people who tell him how great he is. Uh, he has press conferences where he asks people to praise him. Uh, he's going to be in for a situation where he's got Barack Obama and Joe Biden and a lot of people making the very easy case against what Donald Trump has done, given where we find ourselves uh, and the case for Joe Biden. I want to get your reaction to uh, the testing situation, uh, first of all, with the White House itself, because we've seen this outbreak of coronavirus in the White House, the vice president's press secretary testing positive uh, and now uh, others being concerned and, uh, and self-quarantining, Dr. Fauci among them because they've been in contact with that. Uh, it, what kind of example does this set to let's just limit it to office businesses, let's say, you know, big insurance well, companies, uh, when people want to go back to work, what kind of testing, what kind of protection they need? Well, Lawrence, it sets a glaring, glaring example of how we are so short of testing. If the White House feels that they need everyone in the president's uh, uh, near presence and everyone in the White House tested, what about everyone else? And perhaps the greatest failure of this administration is on testing. The president at that press conference said that uh, they had really um, met the moment and prevailed. Really? 
we have so many deaths, we have increased uh, number of disease, diseases, we have people who don't have food, are worried about the roof over their head, and we have prevailed. And the irony for Donald Trump is he's desperate to get us all back working again. But until we have adequate testing, people aren't going to go back to work or go to the restaurants or go to the theaters or anywhere else. And we are way short of what we need. Uh, South Korea, at this point in their fight against corona, had about uh, two million, had a, had a per capita level that in the United States would be two million tests per day. They said we had 300,000 and bragged about it. It was really closer to 250, but it's not even close. I have been calling on the president for two months to use the Defense Production Act to commandeer the factories and the supply chains and get those tests produced. Two months ago, President Trump said anyone who wants a test can get one. Well, that may be true in the White House. It's hardly true anywhere else. And that is the biggest problem we face. And the huge irony of this is a president who's so desperate to push us to go back to normal doesn't have the ability, decency, honor, strength, competence to give us the tools to allow that to happen, namely testing and contact tracing, which the countries who have succeeded, there are models here. Unfortunately, it's not the United States. There are models as to what works. South Korea, Australia, New Zealand, Germany, Finland, Singapore, five of which, by the way, had women uh, as heads of state. But they knew what to do. Large amounts of testing that worked, accurate testing that worked, and then contact tracing. And their, their deaths, their disease is diminished. They are going back to work. Donald Trump will never get us back to work unless he starts looking at the truth. And one other point I'd make. Maybe we'll have an opportunity to hear the truth from an administration official tomorrow. Dr. Fauci is testifying before the Senate. We've been pushing McConnell to do hearings, to do oversight, to do what Congress is supposed to do, to prod this administration to do what it seems unable to do. And that is to bring people before us and do tough questioning. Dr. Fauci will have the opportunity to testify for the first time with Donald Trump not lurking over his shoulder. You know what I say to Dr. F to Fauci? Go for it. Tell us the truth. America needs to hear the truth, and President Trump, your boss, needs to hear the truth.